Well, good. Well, uh, my name is Levi Sim, and you are joining us for a photo focus webinar. And I'm glad you guys are here. And I'm most glad that Hernan Rodriguez is joining us today. Absolutely. He is a commercial portrait photographer. You could, yeah, commercial portrait photographer. I mean, I, I say it that way. It's got a yeah. commercial feel to it. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, I guess I guess you sell them for other than displaying in their home. That makes it commercial. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. Um, and I'm glad you're here. And he's got he's got a presentation for us to to help us improve our photography. If you haven't turned on your chat, there's a chat button on your window, and you can you can weigh in there, and I'll keep an eye on it and watch for questions. If I skip you, it's because it was a bad question. I'm just kidding. <laughs> if I if I miss your question, please feel free to write it again, and um, and we'll we'll interact with with Hernan as as we go, and I'll help him keep an eye on those those comments and questions. And comments and questions are welcome. We we'd love a discussion here, and uh, and and all comments and, and all questions. Really, we're we're not going to pick on you for asking what f stop you used. That that's not a bad question here. Absolutely. Uh, all, all the questions are welcome. So, and uh, why don't we let you get to it, Hernan? Yeah, why don't you share your screen? And so I'll, I'll start. Yeah, I'll share in a second. So, yeah, thank you for the opportunity for uh, for me to share it. I think, um, especially now with the pandemic and what's going on, and not being able to get out, you know, hopefully things are changing. Um, it looks like a good year coming up too, as well for for all of us and. Maybe it's an opportunity where we all took time to study and, and catch up on certain things and practice and because that's how we, we all become better. Now, Levi was saying, feel free to ask questions. I, I, I enjoy it. You know, I even told Le Levi, just chime in, you know, interrupt because part of the discussion or what makes it monotonous, I think the PowerPoint presentations, it's just like, okay, we're sitting and we're just watching slides. You know, I mean, I got the slides to guide us in our discussion, but I think there's little nuggets in each thing that I'm going to present. So you might see a picture, but I might try to elaborate on what I did, what the purpose of the shot was, and maybe the scenario, the lighting, or, you know, sometimes there's complications on how am I going to do this? or what's the approach? So, you know, I think photography is always about minimizing because we come into a place and there's so many things going on and, you know, light coming in from all directions. And, you know, sometimes we have to just cut it down to the, 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 the bare roots of, of the shot and, and that ends up being just the personality, you know, and, and it's happened to me. Sometimes I've had, you know, a, a truck full of lights, tons of gear. I pack up a whole studio for like seven hours, honestly. And uh, I did that with Mike Tyson and Evander Holyfield reunion portraits. We brought everything and it ends up, we ended up using two lights. You know, the setup was basically, you know, 12 minutes, but it's, it's good to be prepared, but, you know, sometimes it's just going to come to the person, you know, the person's going to guide and direct you on what they want and the field of the, the whole photo shoot. So, and that's what I got, you know, that's what I'm going to start sharing with you now. Uh, Levi, we were talking earlier, what my background is. I've been doing this for 18 years. And before that I was an illustrator. I was in graphic design. Uh, then I got into like Eric, you know, I did Photoshop, you know, tons of Photoshop and you know, just compositions and plating and everything. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I studied color. I studied color for 30 years. So a lot of the work you see for, you know, the body of work that I have, I try to get everything in camera. It's funny though, because I've become more of a purist in photography where I try to get everything in the can mm -hmm. where, you know, because of my clients now, we were talking about commercial photography. Um, you know, these people would need an image, like basically shooting on screen, let me approve this, let's get it straight, and it goes to production. So I don't have the time to like, okay, I'll do this and post, or let's try this. You know, the style of work I, I, I create is just like, okay, this is what we want, can you do this? And I, I do it with colors, you know, I do it with controlling light, I put flags and gobos and try to create the mood. You know, I try to do the vignettes in camera, I don't, I think maybe, 85% of the time it's all in camera as far as vignetting, you know, I, I don't, I don't put a vignette on post-production. I, I don't, I personally don't believe in that because I think pixels tend to get muddy and gray. So, yeah. you know, that's a little thing that I'll teach you guys along the process here, but uh, this should be fun. This is your class. And, you know, I, I let you guys guide me along the process and what you want to learn and what direction I, I'll go with. But um, 
let's go ahead and start sharing, right? Absolutely. And I, I like what you said about, about sometimes it just depends on the person when you get there and, and being flexible to, to what, what your plan was and what, what's going to happen. And, and, and that's why I'm glad everybody's tuning in because this continuous learning is how you stay flexible. Right. What's well, a funny Levi, because, you know, I, I mean, you, it's preparation meets opportunity. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think for us as photographers, we have to do as much homework. You know, we do that at home. That's what's called homework, because when you go out on the field or in a job, you're not going to be doing that practicing. That's right. You know, it's not going to be waiting for you to like adjust the light or play around, you know, maybe some minor adjustments, but, you know, you have to be just to be able to produce and get that done right away. Mm -hmm. And it happened to me sometimes where I might light for seven hours. I did something for VH1 on um, Hip Hop Hollywood, you know, one of these reality shows. And we lit for seven hours. Honestly, we put tons of lighting. We did all this stuff. The first shot that came on the monitor, the, the uh, director, the art director did not like, or the actual client didn't like. So it's like, what do you do? You know, like, yeah, you got to change everything within minutes. So if I don't practice this, if I don't know, like, okay, what's my to go to set up my next setup, you know, so I, I calmly told her like, you know, you got shine, go, go fix your makeup, which was not true, but it gave me about <laughs> five minutes to get the biggest light source I could provide. It was a seven foot parabolic. I put a scrim in front. It took us maybe five minutes to set up and it was beautiful light. It's approved and that, you know, but that's what happens, you know, that's you're, the director becomes the talent, or if you're working with, you know, an ad agency, then it becomes, you know, the art director. So it really changes. So you have to be flexible to, to do that. But again, all the work is done prior to this. I call this capturing mood with light and color because I think any portrait you create, anything that we do as far as taking pictures of people, um, and I say taking pictures of people because portraiture could be it called like portraiture falls under the, the the confines of classic or commercial, like we were saying, you know, your commercial portraitist or you know your uh, a high school portrait photographer, or your child photographer, or your boudoir. There's all these different disciplines, you know. But I think it really comes to the root of a person. You know, you're taking pictures of people. And sometimes people feel different, you know, certain days than others. And their mood might be different one day than it's different another, you know? And I think we have to be really sensitive to that. We have to be sensitive to identify, is that what they want to show us in this portrait? Or maybe they're just having a bad day, you know? It's not a matter of my skill and what I'm going to light them with. It's a matter of like making them feel comfortable, bring yeah. them to a place of comfort and then take the portrait. So, you know, we're, we're, anything that deals with picture taking, you know, that's why I call it light and mood and color because we have to identify the mood. You know, we built the light because light has personalities. I mean, you know, you have hard light and it creates hard shadows. It's very predictable. Small light source, you know, hard shadows, you know, and, uh, you know, you big light source and soft light, it's soft shadow. So it's very, and it, the moods are completely different. If you see a commercial portrait and a, you know, classic portrait, you know, one is going to have all these beautiful tones that the dynamic range and the shadows and the transitions from the highlights to the shadows. It's just like really soft and you really don't see that, that difference where, you know, a fashion shoe might be shot with a snood and really dark black shadows. So, but it serves its purpose. Like what's the objective of that image? And then let's go and create that with light and with color. So this shot here was for Eddie Griffin. I've been working with Eddie Griffin for 10 years now. He's a comedian and, and uh, he does a lot of movies, you know, comedic movies. And now he's got a residency in, in Vegas. So we created for a billboard uh, for Eddie. I rarely light with white light. You know, I mean, most of my lights, I use flash, I use LEDs, I use pretty much anything that I could use. But I'm always filtering my light to create that mood or to balance it with the actual atmosphere that we have. You know, if I'm shooting in an indoor lobby, then I need to feel like it's an indoor light source. You know, it's gotta be motivational to whatever I'm finding there. And that's why as photographers, we have to be very aware of our light sources. It isn't like, okay, let's put a flash. And I get this from a lot of people like, you know, it looks too, they use speed lights and they don't like, they're scared of using their speed lights because it creates this pop, this really candid 
overexposed look, it's just a matter of knowing why it's doing that. You know, you could right. crank that down to minimal power. You could put a filter, put a, you know, an amber filter, put something soft, you know, to it to cut that edge off. You could filter it to through a tissue paper. You know, there's so much you could do that to create 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 that image like it's belonging. You, you see, the thing about portraiture is that you don't want to, the first thing you want to see is the light. Oh, like right. that it's beautiful light, which, you know, it, I mean, it's nice, but I want to be able to see like, oh my gosh, like, like he looks great or he looks cinematic or there's something about him or the first thing I see is his expression or whatever. And we do that through light. So, um, here, let's see here. Uh, camera. Uh, sorry, real quick on that, on that last picture. Uh, was that a strobe or a continuous light? Wayne wants to know. So, yeah, I got this behind the scenes further up, but this was all done with strobes. And, you know, when I'm creating, and this was shot in a seamless blue paper. You know, uh, you know I mean, that's a good point because I, I want to stop and pause on this, though I have the slides uh, up to, to show the actual lighting diagram. But sometimes when I'm shooting on location and I need to find out and ask as many questions as I can, you know, and this was going to be shot on a blue background with blue tones and everything. So, you know, naturally, if I use a blue seamless paper and I could do a little bit of post work behind after, you know, after, after the shot and do some post work on it, the blue base is already there. Right. I have to do any extraction, you know, and a lot of people say like, well, do you use green screen? I don't even own a green screen. I did early on in my career. I rarely seldom use a green screen. I just create, you know, if I, I probably use black, white, and I'm about maybe 80, uh, about 60% I'm using seamless paper rolls. The rest of the time I'm on location or doing environmental portraits, but I use seamless papers to the color of the final image. You know, whatever that purpose is, if it's like an editorial and it's all like high key, then I use white. And sometimes I get the uh, request to like, can you do this? And can we do some post work? Or can we extract it and do something with it after? Well, if you shoot it in white, it serves for a commercial portrait but I could also extract it easily with a click of a wand and extract the image and put it somewhere else. Now, if I have green, it still has those undertones sometimes. Yeah, it like has between the hair and stuff. Between yeah, the hair, you know? And, you know, sometimes what I do when I use green screen, just a little, you know, I'm giving little antidotes here and there because we have one hour. When I'm shooting with green screen, sometimes I use the opposite of green and an RGB scale is magenta. So sometimes you might actually put magenta hair lights to get that halo off because it's canceling out the green striking the uh the fringing of the yeah. of the halo so the magenta will automatically cancel out and you have a neutral you know balance neutral skin tone so i do that sometimes when i do that's a little trick i i, I share with you guys but most of the times i'm us using a base color this was shot with um a rapid box you know like a little octa box I take the filtration out. I know it's got tons of layers. You could put, you know, a baffle, you could put an over layer. You know, the more layers, understand, the more layers you're putting on a light source, it's cutting power and it's spreading the light. So no longer do I have a directional light, which makes it more commercial, more fashion. I'm putting, you know, a scrim. It's assimilating the, the spread of light and it's changing the quality of light. So always consider that when you're using a softbox, you don't use softbox out of the box as is, you know, unless that's the, the, with the feel of the image you want. You know, you're always peeling back and you need to also study your softboxes. If you have a white inner baffle, white is softer, it spreads, it doesn't, it's not, it's less specular, Let, you know, a, a silver baffle ends up bouncing and intensifies that light source and it amplifies the direction and, and you know, the, the specularity. So these are the things that you have to consider when you're photographing, like, well, Hernan said use a softbox, well, I use a softbox with a silver baffle because it gives me a kind of uh, a between fashion and portrait feel to that portrait. I, I rarely use white because it goes more towards that kind of soft portraity, you know, wall. You know, we don't want a, a wall portrait. We want something that pops out of a, a magazine. So mm. that's why that's why I use that. And this was all shot with with flash and flash because it's going to be a billboard. You know, if I use continuous light, it gets a little soft. We want it sharp through and through. You know, it's going to be blown up to, you know, a six foot, I mean, a six story building. So, you know, I'm shooting probably at an F-16 for something like this. Yeah. And, uh, and I have a lot of light. I need the power. You know, I probably used, you know, 3000 watts per second for an image like this as well. 
uh, cumulatively using all these light sources. So, and I'll, I'll share the slide with you to see what that looks like. Super. Now, yeah, go ahead. Nope, that's all. Thank you. Now for this shot here, for instance, and you know, we think I've been with Tamron now for gosh, 15 years, early in my career. Uh, they were very supportive when, when they were getting into portrait, portraiture because they were, you know, Tamron was, you know, a lot of landscape and macro photography and everything. And it was a good marriage at that time because, you know, I was doing commercial work. My career was kind of in the up and coming. We partner and it's, it's a great lens, man. I mean, what I yeah. see, you know, the production of those lenses to what they are now, it's pretty amazing. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and so we thank them and we, because they put us together, you know, we, they, they mm -hmm. brought us together to be able to share. So here's my feed. I'm pretty bad about sharing my feeds, but, you know, anybody wants to follow me. I should have tens of thousands of followers, but I, I don't because <laughs> I prefer working and being with people than sitting on a little thing and saying, look at what I do, you know? Um, now well, screenshot have, that everybody and, and go give them a follow. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I'm very approachable. Send me an email, send me a message. You know, and I get this sometimes. They're like, really? I said, yeah, somebody calls and is like, oh my gosh, I have a photo shoot. What, what can I do? I'll, I'll gladly help you. Because you know, when, in, when I was at that place, you know, I either wish I had somebody like that or I was really fortunate when I had somebody like that. So, you know, it's full circle. This was shot for Russell Peters. If you guys know who Russell Peters is, he's a comedian. He's doing, you know, specials on Netflix and, you know, he also does movies. Uh, I shot this at his Malibu uh, house and this was for a publicity shot. You know, we were talking about commercial portraiture, you know, the work I do, and I work with a lot of celebrities, I've, I've photographed probably like 15 world champions. I photograph, you know, Grammy award winning people, musicians, like Gypsy Kings, athletes from, you know, Boston Celtics to the Lakers or Dodgers. And I'm really blessed to go into these people's lives because if it wasn't for my camera, I wouldn't be at a place here with, you know, some world-class person, right? So, I think your work really is the one that is, for me personally, my work is what it has opened those doors for me. So that's something that anybody out there wants to do. It's just practice, practice and pursue, you know? I set this type of work for me as a goal. I just didn't like fall into like, oh, this is what I do now. You know, I got lucky. No, I set that, I set that as a goal. I said, you know, I want to do commercial work. I want to do celebrity work and I pursued it. I took the avenues, you know, I spoke to agents. I did a lot of stuff for free for, and, you know, even now I selectively do work for free because, you know, if I have, you know, a five-time Grammy award winning person, well, you know, they could get anybody to take their pictures. So we compromise, you know, I'm always testing, but, you know, it's a compromise. Like, sure, I will provide these beautiful images for you, but let me promote myself with those images. So, you know, right. this is how we work this, in this industry. And this was done something for his publicity. I never know where these images end up. Sometimes somebody calls like, hey, it was in a magazine and a cover of magazine. I've seen them in covers. I've seen them in billboards. I've seen them. I basically am dealing with the, the talents. That's what I do. You know, are you an editorial photographer? Well, you know, that's, I don't call myself an editorial photographer. Yeah, but my images get into editorial work mm -hmm. or advertising or publicity or for products, for anything, you know, but it becomes just the person. You know, again, it goes back to the individual. Can you take my picture? Absolutely. And I'm going to do the best shot I can with you. What are the parameters and what do you need this for? And I do that, you know, let's do commercial and let's go off and shop your images. This is your fee. And this is how I do, you know, my business. But, you know, this was done in his house and it was done with kind of a mix of light. I'm going to show you what that was. And sometimes, you know, when we go into a place, it's because like, oh, we're shooting indoors. Let me just put flash. Well, flash has a Calvin of, you know, 5,500, you know, 52 to 5,700, depending what those bulbs are and the recycle time is on that. Um, but it's gonna give you more of a bluer light. And if I'm shooting indoors and you know, there's incandescent lighting and there's overhead recessed lighting, you know, I have to take that into consideration. Am I gonna try to you know, overpower that light? Is that part of the light? And in this case, there was a beautiful uh, lamp. If you see on the behind the scenes, that little you know, design lamp over his head, and one of the shots I used that as as part of his um, his portrait. You know, he was holding a gun, and there was this big old crazy light source behind it. Well, I had to make sure my flash was balanced to that incandescent light. I mean, that overhead light, right? That's probably a 3200 Kelvin. So what did I do? I filtered my 
my flashes with a, I call it pale bastard amber, which is, it's not CTO, the color temperature orange. For me, I rarely use a CTO because it tends to go more towards the red. Yeah. And depending on, this, on, on the skin pigment, you know, he was, you know, kind of darker skin and you, you would really identify that orange. So I use either straw, I use pale bastard amber, or I use a, it's called GAM Cosmetics, which I'll show, I'll share with you guys. These are tricks of the trade again. Levi, I mean, you know, you could probably pick up some, some of this. No, I'm, I'm, I'm writing some notes right now. Yeah, because yeah, because I have the same issue with, with CTO is that it's often just too. Yeah, and I'm going to show you a whole line. I yeah. work with Roscoe. I've been, you know, with working with Roscoe for about seven years now. They're my sponsor. And, uh, you know, their tech, their national, their national uh, manager has been so beneficial to, to me understanding color. Because I know color, but color in the science of photography is completely different. Because yeah. you know, you're talking about, you know, in an RGB scale, which is red, green, and blue, which is what we use as photographers, either our cameras or our monitors, you know, the, the secondary colors of RGB is CMY, and that's for print production, or that's to offset the, you know, the counterbalance of the, the um, complementary color of that red is the cyan. So if you look in, under if, info on your either Lightroom or Photoshop, and you see RGB on info, it'll say RGB and right adjacent to that is CMY. So you know that anytime you're manipulating that red, you're affecting the cyan, right? Yeah. And the G, anytime you're manipulating or altering that G, it's the magenta, which is the opposite color. So there's always a balance. If you find a skin tone has too much green, well pump up the magenta because that's the opposite of that green. Adding, green, adding magenta takes away green. And this is what you do. So working with Roscoe, they really took my, to my, my, my understanding to a different level you know, learning what colors that, that are going to absorb or what you need to do that are less obvious, you know? And mm -hmm. then, you know, they've, won, they've got multiple Oscars uh, in cinematography just on creating these filters. And it's, it's all science-based. So why not just plug and play? You know, you don't have to know everything. You know, it becomes intimidating, but just know the basics. Know that RGB is CMY and manipulate those colors and you have good shots, you know? And in this case, if you have too much of, of blue, you know, then you're adding a little bit of, you know, that, that yellow or that orange in between color, right? Yeah. A CTO adds a lot of red again, as we spoke. So I end up using a pale bastard amber and that's what I balance those flash. So it doesn't look like it's just blue light and orange, you know, recessed lighting. So, and there's also window light, you, you know, I have to consider on the far right corner, there's, there was a big bay window. So is that part of my shot or do I need to filter that light as well? So you might put a film on that window, which is a seat, you know, it's also the same um, amber gel, which makes it the same warm color coming through that window. So now what you have is, uh, is one light source, one color. Mm -hmm. Not that you do because I have multiple light sources and incandescent lighting and I have, you know, one flash and a window light, but it's all consistent. It's all as of one light source. You know, and this is what we need to know in regards to white balance and color balance. So, yeah, I hope that helps. <laughs> that helps me a whole lot. I, yeah, I hope other folks are getting to it. Lots, uh, as we go along really quickly. OK, this is kind of the the uh, the, the uh, guts of what I call, you know, what I do for my work. I consider what a portrait is. Right. And I always have these slides up front because I think we need to understand what a portrait is. A portrait is not the same for you as it is for me, you know, as it is for my my, my mother, my, a portrait from my mother is having the whole family, right. you know, she doesn't care what the lighting looks like. It's a beautiful, <laughs> it's a beautiful shot because we got the mm -hmm. nephews and the family and all the expressions. She could identify the whole family with honest expressions. That's what's valuable to her as a, as a, for a portrait. As right. photographers, we become so skilled in identifying like, oh my gosh, this light's off or this or that. And we, we get so affixed on trying to correct that and then we lose the presence. We lose what the portrait is. And the, pre the, pur the purpose of the portrait is capturing the person in front of you. Yeah. That's, very, that's the, you know, the first objective. And we do it through light. So what is light, you know? And understanding ratio, you know, ratio could also be a bit intimidating too when we talk about ratios in photography. Um, it's really the mood. You know, ratio, if you call it to just uh, a word, it would be contrast. You know, it's right. synonymous with contrast. What's the lighting ratio? Well, the lighting ratio is the contrast of the portrait. Mm -hmm. you know, the highlights to the shadows. How much, how much shadows are, you know, how deep are those shadows, how dark, how many stops are, you know, from that brightness to the, the dark side of the portrait. So 
that's what we, we also need to understand. Uh, creating your story. You know, I'm gonna have some slides too, because when you go into a photo shoot, it isn't just like on a whim, like, oh, I'm doing a photo shoot. I need to study the person. I need to, you know, we have Instagram, we have Facebook, you know, tell your clients, can I, can I, can I follow you? You know, can I see your Facebook? Because you're gonna see all these pictures that they took of themselves that they identify with. You're gonna study them, you're gonna see like, oh my gosh, they, they're always smiling. This is who they are or whatever. Or, you know, they, they're introvert or whatever it is. So that helps you identify and study a person. But, you know, me as a, a commercial photographer, I got storyboards, I got mood boards, you know, I got creative directors, I got art directors, I got managers, and then I got the talent. And we all have to be on the same page for that day of the photo shoot. So this is what I, what I call creating your story. Pre-planning production is the same thing. This is all done ahead of time. I say the more you could do on paper, the less you do on the field. Mm -hmm. you know? And if I could have all these things done and you know, my, my, my storyboards and identifying my schematics, you know, what my lighting schematics are and even colors. Sometimes I even identify specific modifiers that I'll use. Then I could go rest assured in, in the photo shoot and just be so involved with, with the talent, you know? We got qual quantity of light, we got quality of light, color of light and cinematic light. Well, what is cinematic light? Um, and we'll get more into the specifics of that. Um, a portrait quick, again. Quick, sorry, quick question for you um, from, from our audience. Real quick, what, what's, what's kind of a bare bones kit you're gonna take out? What, what lenses do you like to, to have with you? And like, how many lights do you bring? So for a bare bones, I got two, I got two go-tos, okay? If I have the flexibility of going with two lights, um, I might just take, well, what I have now are my uh, Westcott, the FJ Westcott, so those 400 watt second lights. They are so, I'm really impressed with them. I used to be with uh, Dynalite. I was sponsored with Dynalite and mm -hmm. um, also 10 years. Now they, you know, they, they lost their business about you know, a year and a half ago, almost two years ago. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Dynalite, I mean, uh, Westcott has these amazing uh, portable lights. They're, you know, they're, they're relatively affordable. Uh, it cranks out 400 watts per second. And I find out it's got enough power to compete with the sun. For me, that's the most important thing. When I'm shooting and I'm using flash, you know, you have to know, is that, is that flash strong enough to be competitive with, with, with that ratio or that contrast right. ratio from the sun? Because if I have two watts, you know, 200 watts second and the sun is at an F-16 in California and blown daylight, you're not going to get much of, of anything with that, with that light. You know, so I think I go with those two. Uh, I got a backpack. I go with that two light setup. Most of the time, I'm using that light, and believe it or not, I find out that I'm just I'm just using a five uh, five inch reflector. So it's that little reflector that you put on the yeah. flash head. The little it's cone. Like, yeah, exactly. It's like a you know the the, the little cone, uh, and it's got a diffuser. It's got like a maybe a half a stop diffuser on it, and. For me, I could just crank it up if I need to just power up and balance it with that light. But I found out that I could dial it down and use that light source as my main light or as, you know, my fill light as, as, as a kicker. Yeah. By what I mean, a kicker is that, you know, you have the sun and I'm using that as, you know, at F16 or something, right? And the shadows are really, the contrast is too hard. I might crank it up just to get, minimize those shadows a little bit, you know? Yeah. So, you know, it's serving as a fill. I'm trying to use the same quality of light as well. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes we find out, well, we're using two different light qualities. We're shooting outdoors and I see this portrait of all the hard shadows done behind and this, this beautifully lit portrait with the soft box. And though the skin tones are all soft and, and dreamy, it's very fake looking because look at the background. The background is just blown out and hard shadows. So it looks like it's lit. I don't right. want my work, you know, I want my work to look consistent. So I try to match my artificial lights to the actual, you know, atmosphere light, you know, like, like this, whatever the scenario is, if I'm shooting at 6 p.m. at night, while well, the, the, the shadows become long and soft, so maybe I might use a soft box, you know, so these are the things that I'm always considering, but, you know, for the, the regards to this question, I'm using that one flash head, one five inch reflector with the diffusion, and I'm either cranking it, you know, at full power, or I'm minimizing just to get a little kick of light. So sometimes I might get my subject in open shade and there's no directional light. 
I use the amb the ambient as fill, you know, maybe in a, like a F4, you know, some a shot like that in open shade, maybe under a tree or maybe somewhere like in in the woods or whatever it might be, you know, that you might choose. I might be shooting at a 60th of a second at F4, for instance, you know, ISO maybe 200, just to make it a little bit brighter. And an image like that might be a little flat, though it's accurate as far as your exposure. So what, yeah. I, what I do is I get my flash head, just crank it up to a 3.2. I'm gonna get a 2.8, 3.2. I'm not going up to F4 or, or, or stronger. I like what I see, I just need a kicker. So right. my flash is, is supplementary, you know, it's just a little bit of light just to get that, you know, that extra pop in there. So this is what you guys have to consider when you're shooting outdoors that, you know, the flash is what's the purpose? You know, it doesn't mean that you're using full power because you have it, you're using one tenth of the power. Right. Just to give you a little bit of kick in there, right? So just I like that answers that question. Yeah, just like your last slide. What's the purpose? What's the, what, what exactly. am I doing? Exactly. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, so, real, and I'm what, and, examples of that. Oh, good. And what, what, are your, what are your lenses that are always in your bag? Okay, so the lenses I use, oh my gosh, you know, when I, when I started, I look back at the articles, I've written so many articles for magazines. And when I first started my career, I only used one lens. It was a 70 to 200. The 70 to 200, because I, you know, I did a lot of commercial headshots and I did you know, advertising stuff. And I found out I could get really nice tight shots. I could pull back and get a fashion shot. Um, and I did this for years and I found out that my work just was very specific, you know? It was though the expression, like I love the expression and I'm always projecting the expression in my portrait, like what you see, no matter what's going on, I bring the face up forward as, as much as you can. But then everything else suffered because I wouldn't see where they were and it was a beautiful location. So I started kind of expanding, you know, expanding my lens, lens, lens choices. I started using a 35 millimeter lens and you know, if used properly, you could really just create beautiful stories with it. And if you have a clean composition, and by what I, what I mean by that is that if you got a shot and it's just a beautiful location and you're able to cut off, you know, distractions of light beams and, you know, street scenes or whatever it is, just a nice shot. And sometimes I might shoot a celebrity with like a classic car that they have. I wouldn't shoot that with a 7200, you know, I would shoot that with a right. 45 millimeter lens or 35 because I want that the narrative of that portrait to be storytelling. You know, the car, the palm trees, the background, some of their house. So I started working a lot wider, you know, and I've been shooting a lot of these young kids, um, you know, and, and for us as photographers, it's helped me as in my career because we, we, we study the classics and the confines of what the rules are in portraiture. You know, half the hands like this, when it's a woman, you know, you can't show the front of the fist, you can't do certain things. Right. They have to have their arms, you know, you know, at a certain way. They, you know, the head tilt has to be a specific way for a guy, which is this way, or you know, a woman could tilt to the low. These are the things that we study, and it's good to know. You need to know all this, but you need to know that loosely, you know, enough to know that okay, this looks off because the head tilt is way off. Uh, but I'm finding out that you know the style of portraiture now is so loose because you have Instagram, you got social media, you got a lot of influencers, you have this whole even the big celebrities who are, you know, season 65, 50, 45 year old celebrities, they're really attaching themselves to the younger generation because they, they have the pull, they have the leverage, you know, they have the 20 million followers. And that whole style has changed a little bit of the way portraiture, what we call portraiture to be. That's what yeah. these cell phones and these apps are really, uh, you know, all these apps are really advancing in regards to educating the viewer like this is what we see now in this era. So for me, I, I'm, I'm really aware of that. And I need to know as photographers, we need to know that direction of where that is going and then apply the regulations and the rules to kind of um, make those adjustments in that style of portraiture. So, you know, I've been working with guys from Hulu and Netflix, a lot of these young kids who are the, like the new Hollywood and they have that look all of, the, all of the editorial and covers of magazines have a certain vibe, you know? And I just shot a kid for, he did Star Wars and um, he, he, he's doing a movie with Kelsey Grammer this year. He's in a lead role. We shot in Santa Monica with a 35 millimeter lens and one light. You know, he had his wardrobe, like really nice expensive wardrobe, but it was all kind of that, that hip hop urban vibe, you know, like standing by a bridge, 
looking off to one side, very voyeuristic, you know, look at me, but don't look at me type of style. And knowing that style, then I'm always uh, plugging in, you know, 18 years of what I know, the direction of light, is the light consistent? Is it showing, is it too much in shadow? Do I have enough fill? Is the same quality of light? Is the skin tone, is the texture of the skin, can I use and get away with a hard light? Do the shadows look too hard, you know? If he has bad complexion, I can't use a hard light source. Let's get him into a softer light, but let's still go with that vibe he wants and let's soften that look a little bit. You see what I mean? So this is my whole thought process. So it's kind of two worlds colliding and creating that two days portraiture, you know? And again, if I'm not aware of that and I have colleagues who are so confined and closed minded into understanding and expanding that, that spectrum, they're, they're becoming very, um, they don't have work, put it that way. Yeah, right. they're not pursued because they can't do what, what we were asking for now. So we have to be very aware of that. Uh, you know, and it comes down to this slide, what I'm talking about, it's really, what is, what is a portrait? You know, it becomes down, it's a picture, a painting or a sculpture. That's what it's always been, you know, some type of image that, that, that displays the, the face and its expression. That's what it is, you know. When you're showing a uh, portrait, you know, you're sometimes showing a expression or you're showing the face. You know, sometimes you're, you're, you're showing the face with the eyes closed. Is that a portrait? I, it, it's a portrait to me. You know, the person is, is just evoking a mood. You know, if you go to the next line here, the intent of lighting is to display the likeness, the personality and the mood of the person. So if I got a person who's very uh, introvert and maybe they're creating a CD cover and it's very, contemplative and very artistic. They got their hand in their, you know, on their, their, their hand in their head, looking off to the side. Maybe their eyes are closed. Is that a portrait? It is a portrait. It's serving a purpose for, you know, marketing a brand, which is a CD or a music label, a feel. It's evocative. I'm using color, I'm using mood, but you know, it, it serves a different purpose. Would I use that as a wall portrait for the family? I wouldn't use that, you know? Um, and then you also have to consider mood. Mood is very important because I think the mood sometimes, it's not always consistent. They say, you know, we always use that term or that cliche uh, that, that, that uh, what is it? Um, the soul of to, the soul to the heart, or a picture is the soul to the heart or, you know, some, what's that, that old cliche? Like the, the, the eyes are the window eye. to the soul or? Yeah, you know, like you, you capture the you capture the soul, you capture the right. essence, or whatever it is, you know. Yeah. And we always see a portrait, it's like, oh my gosh, like you, you know, you captured the soul, or you. It's not always that the case, because the person might only show you something specific that day, mm -hmm. and that's all they want to show you. You know, I get celebrities sometimes who are always hiding behind the image, and that image is not their image; it's the image with people and the. The, the, the audience and a certain platform perceives them to be. So sometimes it, I'm telling, I'm, I'm, I'm asking myself, is that what, is that who they are? Is that what they want me to see? So, you know, I had to break down these layers, you know, and you might not shoot celebrities or commercial work, but, you know, you get a couple, you know, you're doing an engagement portrait and, you know, the guy normally is the guy the, who's the introvert. The, the girl brings the, 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 you know, the groom to be like, oh, come on, we got to do this. It's the portrait is, you know, for a wedding and everything. And he's three steps behind because he's like, oh my gosh, like, I don't like taking pictures or, or whatever yeah. it is, you know, you have to break him down sometimes. And you have to say, okay, let's do something that's artistic to you. You don't have to look at the camera. Just give me an honest, you know, you, you almost have to make yourself a fly in the wall. And, you know, in a session like that, and I've had engagement portraits, you know, and it's like, you just, pretend I'm not here. And it's easy to say because you are there, but you know, you have to break them down and get into their, a common ground with a subject. And what is that common ground? You know, you have to, you gotta, you gotta be able to see what, what mood can you give me today? And it might not be the same in five years. They might look back and say, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I was like that. You know, you take a portrait of that couple today, they're maybe they're just like, you know, honeymooners and hugging and kissing, and they'll give you a completely different portrait. Right. So it's different, you know, and we have to be discerning of what it is, but it's got to be accurate for them. You know, that mood has to be accurate for them for that given day and to be able to identify the purpose of that, the objective of that, that portrait. So, I mean, I hope that helps, you know, yeah, thank you. you know, what a portrait is. 
Uh, this is Mark Wallinger, and he's a disc jockey here in California. He, um, he's got a star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame just by being a radio disc jockey. Wow. He's got every award you can imagine just from radio. I mean, he's got all these microphones and, you know, he's a, he's a microphone collector. He's got the rock and roll, Rolling Stone kind of hall, um, what is Hall of Fame. So he's done everything. Um, I shot this at his house, you know, and the funny thing about him, him as a personality boy, he's like, he's, he's very tender hearted and very open. But when you take his pictures, he was so timid. Yeah. He was very timid and he just really didn't give me much, you know. It looked like he was kind of like very contrived and posing, right? So we had to kind of compromise at a place where it was comfortable for him. And I was able to capture something, a history of himself, you know. He didn't want to do this portrait. The best shots of him were outdoors, sitting on this old runny uh, leather sofa with his jeans and chucks. You know, I, I don't have that shot. I couldn't find it because I had like 15 hard drives and this was an right. old photo shoot I did, so I couldn't find that. That was the honest portrait of, of Mark Wallinger and who he is, who he knows, who his daughters know, and who his wife knows. That's the image he used for his own publicity, for his own marketing and social media. But as far as, far as the, the radio station, this is the actual shot for the radio station, you know? It shows history. It shows an elegant man, you know? It shows him face forward. It shows almost a traditional style of what a portrait will be. Now, is that what he likes? You know, he compromised to give me that portrait. Uh, there was one shot right behind this. Again, I could not find it, but the shot that we both like artistically was, I was talking to him through the process. I said, you know, Mark, just close your eyes, close your eyes and, and think about your journey through this process. You know, he's like, oh my gosh, honey. He, closed, he put his eyes down. He was thinking 35 years it took me to get to this point. And when he looked down with his eyes closed and his hand in his head, the way the light cascaded over his hair was beautiful. To me, that was a shot. And for me, that's the shot I would use as, you know, for myself showing, displaying who Mark is. Because it's a personal moment for both of us. Though you can't see it, you see the back of his head. And, you know, you might think like, well, that's not a portrait. That's not showing anything. It's, it's a moment, you know? It's a moment that was precious to both of us and it was, it was likable, you know, it was good for him and it was good for me. So that's the image I would have used. So everybody uses a different image and you got to find out again, what's the purpose of that portrait? Is it for his, his you know, his uh, place of work? You know, is it for marketing? Is it for PR? They're not going to use a picture of him with his head down. They're going to use a picture where his eyes are straight onto the camera, a nice smirk, a nice expression, and just a little history of who he is. So that's why I put this image, you know, I, that was that's a compliment great. in that shot. And what, what lens on that one? I used a 24 to 70 on this lens. You know, the 24 to 70 lens allows me, and probably that's the one lens, if you're to go with just one lens, that's probably your best lens is 24 to 70. It's, you know, it's wide enough to get you to that 24, you know, width and get a story behind the shot. You See, know? and I'm the opposite. I've, well, I've, owned it, I've owned it three times and I sell it every time because I never use it. Do you really? Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. know, it's so funny because that's 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 always in my bag for right. that purpose. Yeah. If all else fails, like it it allows me real estate. That's why I use it. And it keeps it kind of accurate as far as the proportions go, you know? It's yeah. kind of tricky when you're using a wide lens, we gotta consider too. If there's another slide I'll talk about lenses. I'll probably say that to that, you know, what's oh good, yeah. That. Yeah. Because you know, we need to know that. We'll another, let you cruise along. A, a and image. And we're at, we're at uh, 13 of the hour. So we, we may go over folks, if you want to stick around. How many, how many, how many more minutes? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's go quickly through these here. Really quick. Another thing that I shot here was with, uh, you know, another hall of famer. This guy has like four world championship rings. He was uh, scout of the year, talent scout of the, of the year, you know, for the Dodgers. And uh, I said, where can we take your portrait? You know, he just got the, his, his, his ring. He said, well, I got the keys to Dodger Stadium. I'm like, well, there we go. Let's do that in Dodger Stadium. So, you know, this is, again, a 24 to 70. I shot that kind of wide angle on this. And it was one light setup. I'm going to show you what that one light was. I used a small, you know, a, uh, 16 by 18 softbox. And all I did was light a space. You know, I got a little gobo. You see, there's a little scrim, a little gobo underneath that, that softbox. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. I didn't want to blow out the light on his rings and have it just kind of flat all the way, you know, kind of like projecting light. So I kind of made it more artistic. 
had a more fake focus on his face and it fell off a little bit. I cut it off a little bit. I use a, Ro a Roscoe Scion filter, which is, you know, a little bit of bluish. Um, what I do when I'm shooting outdoors, I'm doing custom white balance mm -hmm. by using a Scion filter. Again, we talked about RGB. The opposite of red is Scion in the RGB scale. It's a secondary color. So if I put Scion on my, on my light source and I custom white balance, meaning I correct you know, the, the balance of light hitting my, my source, I mean, my subject, which in this case was cyan, it's gonna add the complementary color, which is the red. So now what I'm doing is I'm colorizing all the, wherever the light does not hit is red now. It neutralizes the skin tones on him, but everything behind him is, becomes red. So now I go back to this one slide. Now you can see all that red, red tint behind him. I'm gonna, I'm gonna steal that, man. I'm gonna, I'm gonna use that a lot. Oh yeah, yeah. You can do this, man. You can change. Look at the look at the skies. It looks more like a Norman Rockwell. Right. It has more of that sepia tone to it, and it's right out of camera. If you see a shot without any color filter, it's it's not it's not nice. It's just Blend, a yeah. snapshot, you know. Yeah. Uh, by by colorizing, focusing the lights and cutting off, you know, the the, the scrim on the bottom with the gobo. I got a beautiful one light setup, and it looks so artistic, you know. That's marvelous. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll send you these slides. Now, really quickly, because I want to get to some, some examples, because I took, I took like two days of setting up this PowerPoint for you guys. How's our audience? Let's take a consensus. If you guys are willing to hang out another 15 minutes, we'll definitely keep on sharing, right? I, I, I think you've definitely got us for at least another 15. Okay. So light is a language, really. The language of photography, what is light? Well, it's executed through physics, and that's all it is. The more you understand what light is, how it behaves, which is science, you could apply it artistically and aesthetically to your, your images, you know? Just, to, just for example, the slide I gave you was knowing that if I put cyan, it's gonna, and I do a custom white balance, the computer's so sophisticated, it's gonna say flash, 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 there's too much cyan. Let me add the same amount of points of that scale of the opposite color. So knowing that a little bit of that science allows you to be creative and to, you know, to, um, execute your vision and that's what what i call it you know this slide here it reflects light reflects and refracts and it's absorbed and dispersed so it's very predictable what light does sometimes it's unpredictable and we allow it to be unpredictable because there's light coming on and it's just in a wide high key studio and you're like oh my gosh my image looks so flat well you got a big light source and you got a white wall bouncing out that white wall and it's flattening your you know the exposure the contrast so if you put a black board on it that's what you see these photographers with black board because now it cuts the light right I have one source and it falls off now i could add a second fill and add it to taste opposed to allowing it to do what it does in a studio so knowing that you know it's very predictable one thing we do about you know moder about light is that we modify you know we're always putting something in front of it uh i use a lot of black tooling just a little trick for you guys Buy yourself, go to a fabric store and buy yourself almost like bridal tooling. You know, instead of white, get black. And if you have a softbox, just put layers and layers of layers. So you put, you know, two layers I start out with and take a shot and you like what it does. And maybe you want to vignette it more, so put an extra two layers. So right out of camera, you get this beautiful vignette. You know, I use a big uh, 32 inch wide deep umbrella. So if you, know, if you want to know how I light in my studio, I got a two light set up. I got two white deep umbrellas and that's my to go to. I put that light source the closest I can to that. I mean, the light source the closest I can to the inner baffle and it gives more of a spotlight. So now it becomes a little bit more projected, more cinematic and you can see it really light up and it falls off, right? Now with that black tooling, it gradates and it becomes a vignette. So if it's too much of a wow. head or too much of a focus, I pull that light further back and now it spreads over. And you, know, you, and you just, you put that sheet over the whole light or do you cut a, a circle? Yeah, so like for instance, if this is my umbrella, you know, and it's yep. kind of like, oh, yeah, it's uh, concave. Con um, convex or concave? No, convex is projected. Outward, yes, okay, yeah, so gotcha. Concave, so go on the inward okay. side, yeah. The umbrella would be concave, it's deep in inside. Uh, so obviously it's got this whole, you know, diameter behind it. So halfway through the diameter, you know, the center of that, that umbrella, I got uh, clamps. 
So I get one clamp on each side and I get a black toolie and I let that black toolie just fall down. And it just falls and, and instead of having a bright light coming from head to, head to toe, it's lighting and I love that quality of that light source. Yeah. Because it's, it's specular enough and it's very, it's got a good pop, but it's soft in transition. It's not like really hard with hard shadows. So, and it softens as it, as the vignettes down with my, the tooling. Cool. So, okay. You know, the two lights set up and I'm using flags, you know, those are the way I create flags. I use snoots and grits, you know, I, I like using that. I use snoots and grids and I also use uh, tracing paper. Roscoe has a, yeah. uh, if you guys want to jot this down, Roscoe has this uh, diffusion panel or, or diffusion roll called OPAL, O-P-A-L. And it's almost like creating your own softbox. Yeah. You know, it's a big roll of tracing paper and you can put sheets and double sheets and create, even if you use a, a snoot, by putting this diffusion, it softens a hard edge and it gives you a pop, almost cinematic pop, but now with a soft edge. Cool. So, you know, light creates mood, and that's what we're talking about, you know, just by placing that light. And it's, you know, my, my basic rule in all portraiture is this here. Place light on what you want to see and take light on what you don't want to, what you want to show, basically. This was just done with one light. It was done with one, one big for now light, and I closed one of the barn doors. And it's funny because this was shot on a white background. My subject was far enough where the light there was a you know the light fall off it goes straight to black mm -hmm. you know and uh by bringing that barn door in i could really create just that nice vignette and i just wanted you to see part of the expression i didn't want to use if i open the barn doors it's again a glamorized candid shot you know you have to make it artistic and i i need to be it's got to be evocative i need to it need, i need to tell a story with my portrait and you do that by placing light or removing light and these are the things that we quickly, you know, use terms on what light is, right? Soft light, hard light, directional light. Directional light is any light source coming off the axis of, of your camera. So if I'm shooting here and if I have light behind my subject, well, that's a straight to camera, same axis, but by bringing it to a 45 degree, now it's directional. And it's coming off the axis, it's focused. Well, if I have that at a 45 degree angle with a big soft box, well, it's not focused, it's spreading light everywhere. But now if I get an umbrella, and I bring that as close as I can to my subject. I'm focusing that light now. And what happens if I collapse my umbrella? Well, it's even you know, focusing much less. So now I got the same quality of light, but I'm able to project just the face or the, you know, whatever I want to show. So these are the terms that we use in, in, in lighting, broad light, short light, high key, low key. You know, well, I don't have time to elaborate on this because you know, our time kind of runs out, but just so you know what we call light, again, we talked about consistency and color of light. It's very cr crucial that you know that, you know, again, this could be intimidating. What is Kelvin, you know? Well, Kelvin goes to a scale from, you know, 1900 or, 20, you know, 1500, which is candlelight to, you know, 8,000, 9,000, which is open shade or overcast. Well, in photography, we're always, it's kind of counterintuitive. We're always thinking opposites, right? When you have your F stop at the 2.8, that means you're letting all the light in. If you're putting it at an F22, you know, you, it, it's always the opposite. You're thinking of adding more light, opening the numbers should be bigger, but they're smaller. So these, these, are, these are the things that I always have to think like, oh my gosh, like it's always the opposite. If I want something to be less green, I gotta add the opposite color, which is magenta. And, you know, so Kelvin is the same thing. If you think that something that's a 3200, which is more that orangey light, well, by putting it at 3200, it's adding the opposite color of the blue spectrum. So, you know, again, it's countering what you, what your, the intent is, you know? Well, if I'm not using any light source and I shoot something at, you know, 1900, it looks all blue. You, if, do that test. If you're shooting something at 2000, well, you put the Calvin at 2000, everything looks bluish green. Right. You know, it's doing blue because it's considering that you're using a 3200 Calvin light. You're using an amber, an orange light source, incandescent lighting or household light. That's what it's thinking. So if you bring a light source that's, you know, candlelight or something, then, oh my gosh, it looks, it looks neutral now because it's doing the opposite of what that spectrum is telling me. You follow me? So yeah. Same yeah. Thing is, you know, if you're up to 5,000 Kelvin and you're using a candle, using a, you know, household light, it looks all orange. Well, because you're at 5,000 and now it's adding, you know, 3,200 Kelvin, it's adding 3,200 
you know, color temperature on top of the 5,000. Now it's all orange. So it's doing the opposite. So all you have to remember is that anytime you're using on the scale, you know, from the orange light to the blue light, and we pretty much just use incandescent lighting or fluorescent lighting or LED light or daylight. Daylight balance is always at the 5,200 Kelvin and it shoots up higher, you know? You need to be consistent on your light sources. That's all you have to consider. What's my light source and what color is it? Is it all uniform? And then light your subjects. The first slide we did, there was a window light coming in that had to be consistent with the flash, which is 5,200 Kelvin, 5,500 Kelvin. That had to be consistent with the overhead light, which is 3,200 Kelvin. There's three different light sources. So what do I do? Let me go to my scale and make this all consistent. What do we, what do we say we make it all 3,500? And then I take a shot and it's all one color temperature. Then I could alter it uniformly. You know, I could evenly modify it to whatever temperature I want, but it all does it globally, if I could sure. do it that way. So, you know, that's why I have this Calvin. Just be consistent in your light, the color of your temperature, and we're, 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 in, we're in shape, you know? Um, creating your story, okay? We talked about creating your story, and some of the big things that we consider here is the quantity of light. The mood is the most important thing when we're creating our story, right? What kind of mood do we want for this portrait? And we do this by the quantity, the quality, and the color of light. Okay, we talked about a little bit about modifying the light, you know, making it soft or hard. And we talked about mood. You know, what's the color of light? Well, the color of light will give us the mood. If it's all indoor and nice kind of lobby lighting, it looks loungy, feels loungy because we shot it inside and everything's at 3200, 3500 Kelvin. We have our flash heads and they're all kind of with that sepia tone and we filter that light. And we have somebody looking elegant sitting back in a nice chair. That's a mood, you know, we're doing, it, we're doing it all through color. You know, if you use flash and that flash overpowers the whole scene, it creates a whole different feel. What does it feel like? You were there shooting uh, candidates, you know, you were um, an event photographer, that's what it looks like. Nothing artistic about it, you were covering an event. So is that what you want? Well, maybe I'm covering an event, it doesn't matter, it's all irrelevant, they just want pictures to document the day. Well, put your flash on camera, boom, 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 shoot, it doesn't matter. The flash overpowers the whole scene and that's fine. You can't, you don't have time to be artistic. So think of what your, your, your purpose is and just use color to get that feel. Uh, these two kids- uh, real, real quick, Hernan, real yeah. quick. Uh, we're, we're at the hour and we're gonna keep going folks. We, we understand that some of you have got to duck out for finish off your lunch period, but this is recorded and we will post it again later on Photo Focus so you can reference back to it. Uh, so if you've got to go, we understand you're not missing out. You can catch up with it later, but we'll keep going for a little bit here. Yeah, thank you guys. There's a lot of nuggets of information. So yeah, do come back and take, check it out because uh, yeah, it sure, it sure will help you out. And thanks for joining us. So we still got a group here going on? We know? still got, yeah, we still got 25 people. Yeah. Okay, great. So we'll keep on sharing and they could come and plug in later. Uh, so really quick, let's go over quantity of light. Okay, this, okay, this is, uh, and these are real jobs that I'm doing. This, this was for the prom, you know, the uh, Netflix, the prom uh, came out this past December. And this was the couple, this was the lead couple that did the, the movie. It ended up they fell in love in the movie as they were doing this and they became a real couple. So, you know, they're like, Karen, could you do some shots for us? And it was kind of fun because, you know, they were open to being creative and, and let's go, shoot around Santa Monica. So we found a few locations here. Uh, this was actually shot in an alleyway here in Santa Monica. And you wouldn't know. I mean, it looks really kind of artistic, kind of moody. If you see behind the scenes shot, which I'll show you, it's just like random. If I don't make it artistic, it's just a random, again, candid shot, you know? And I'm doing this by controlling the lights. I'm creating the mood by focusing my light. And, you know, I could have shot that light everywhere and shown everything. And, you know, there's nothing artistic about that. I wanted to create and show just that their expression, you know, kind of very, again, we talk about voyeuristic look to portraiture. And this is what this is. I focus my light and you see on the, the, the top left, that's the, uh, it's not a five inch, that's a nine inch parabolic. It's a deep dish. And uh, for every foot you use in proximity to the subject, it creates, uh, Every, every, I think every stop is one foot of, of spread. 
So, you know, by going five feet back, you get five feet of spread. If you go nine feet back, you get nine feet of spread. Uh, so we were probably about, you know, seven and a half feet back. So I got seven and a half feet of spread and I dialed it up. You know, I, I got an amb ambient exposure. I think I underexposed the ambient by two stops. So if you see the shot on the left, that's the ambient exposure. And that's what the shot would have looked like. You know, two guys just literally on an alley, but I made it artistic. You know, I put an amber filter. You can see a little bit of the yellow tones, right, on the, the skin. Yeah, that's nice. I put a little bit of that amber filter. I overpowered the sun by two stops, and I created uh, a nice artistic shot for them. So, you know, it's all done again by, you know, and I kicked in my ISO to 400. The light was coming up pretty quick. You know, I think probably was, you know, the last maybe 20 minutes of light. So when I find a shot I like, and I'm shooting outdoors, and I'm losing light, I keep everything the same, but I'm just kicking in my eyes. So, you know, why play around? I like the exposure. I like the uh, depth of field that I, that I had from the shot. I just mm -hmm. kicked my eyes. So, so I went from 125 to 200 to 400. And that was the last shot of the day. Right on. So mood, let's create mood with quality of lights. Okay. We have certain things that creates, creates that, that mood. Okay. We soft light, hard light, or diffuse light. And these are the th three things that I really always pay attention to when I'm creating a portrait that looks belonging, like it's all from the same place. Again, we talked about shooting a portrait outdoors and the shadows are all really hard shadows. At one in the afternoon and we're shooting with soft light. Well, it looks fake already, you know? So let's be consistent in the quality of light that we have. So um, in this case, it produces uh, soft, uh, diffuse shadows, okay? So soft shadows are very predictable. It's basically light that has been dispersed. So if I'm using a soft box, for instance, and that soft box is coming up a I mean, a hard light, you know, if you get a seven inch reflector and I'm using it to my subject, that's a hard light. If I'm bouncing it to the top of the ceiling and letting it spread and open up a room, that's light that's been dispersed. Now, no longer do I have a seven inch reflector as my main light source. I have a seven foot wall as my main light source and it's spreading evenly across and I don't have hard shadows. So, you know, these are the things that we consider, you know, you gotta think sometimes you gotta be very proactive as a photographer. You can't be reactive, like, oh, I got a seven inch reflector. Let me put it on my subject. That's being reactive. I'm reacting to what I have. Being proactive is like, no, this doesn't fit. It's too hard, you know, and it's not, it's not broad enough. So you bounce it off the ceiling and get a beautiful bay of light with a simple speed light. And now it creates a soft light. So I'm changing the quality of that light by just changing the, you know, the bounce, the source. And that's, you know, that's what knowing these, what these principles are. <clears throat> Perfect example here is of this gal, Jen McAllister. I'm gonna show you her creative process of what we did because this was a, a recent shoot. Uh, if you see the, uh, the top behind the scene shot, that was a seven foot reflector by Sunbounce. Um, yeah. Sponsor of mine and boy, that stuff works really well. It's a big seven foot reflector and that's almost like a one light source. She was backlit. If you can see the portrait, all that light is coming from behind that windshield. So, you know, I got to expose for that. I don't want that to be just blown out white. So I make sure like my camera has the latitude to be able to hold that, that, the highlights on that. And I think I might've over overexposed it by maybe a stop and a half, which was fine. So once I got that exposure, I brought in my white board. In that case was that big sun bounce. And I used that hard light source, which is the sun spread over that white source became a diffused light source. So I re, re origin the light and I use the sun now as my main source by dispersing the, the spread of light onto my, and look how beautiful and creamy it is, like beautiful, creamy, you know, lifestyle, it could be lifestyle editorial, just with natural lights, you know? And, but it's again, contrast is like, does that white bounce hold the contrast to, you know, to that, light source coming behind her because that's you know it could be an f-16 you know that in broad daylight that that could be you know f 11 and a half maybe at most f, you know it may possibly possibly f-16 but if, if i'm overexposing that f-16 i could probably shoot it at f-11 means that i have to get a, that light source coming in close you know but this was shot later in the day so probably like five o'clock five o'clock you know lights which is more forgiving so you know, it probably was a F6.1 and I brought that light source to a 5.6, what do I have here? Yeah, so 3.4, 2 250th of a second. So you always do mathematics, always remember contrast, hold the contrast. Does your 
does your exposure hold the contrast from high lights to shadows? Hard light source, well, it's pretty simple. Light, light source that has not been dispersed. Sometimes it's directional focus light is straight out of the camera, it's a speed light. It's a flash head, you know, running through a honeycomb. It's a flash head running through a reflector and it's very predictable. Mm -hmm. It's gonna produce hard shadows. Why? Because, it, you know, usually that hard source is small in relation, in relation to the subject, you know, a speed light, you know, it's a small reflector. A seven inch reflector is also small in relation to, to the subject. Unless I get that seven foot reflector and put it seven feet far from my subject, have it dispersed and spread. Now it gives me a different quality of light because it has to pump up that light to hit my subject. So, you know, you're playing around with fall, light fall off, the inverse square law, which is like, you know, the, the more you double that light, you know, distance from the subject, it, you know, it, 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 it's quarter of that power, which is weaker. Right. It falls off quicker, but it also changes the quality of light. We have to understand that the light quality changes, you know, the shadows become harder. Right. So, um, so that's just another principle that I have. And here's our two examples. These are all done with snoots. Or, or grids. Uh, the one on the left, the black guy, I did with two grids. It was a, a 20 inch grid on his face and a 20 inch grid behind him. So those are two grids, simple shot. The one on the right, uh, the Caucasian guy was with a snood. These were all snoods. A snood is the main light, seven feet up overhead, a snood behind camera left, a snood, you know, camera right. These are all like very directional focus light, but it created that James Dean look. Which was yeah, like, very, very time. Right. Uh, you know, very depictive of, of a style. Exactly. And looks I like used, an old movie. Looks like, like an old looks movie. like Star Trek. Exactly, exactly. And I use filters on that. I use a blue yeah. filter. I use a blue filter. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go quickly too, so you guys can figure out what these Perfect. filters are. Diffuse light, well, it's dispersed light. It's through transmission, right? Uh, it's usually, it could be through shears, you know, window light is diffuse light because it's, it's transmitted through shears. That's what people's like, oh my gosh, beautiful window light. Like, oh, it's like window light's the best, you know, can we create that? <laughs> Basically, it's just diffuse light, you know, it's light coming through. If you don't have a window, and I do this sometimes for my celebrity work, I get these uh, LED lights. I get maybe three strong LED lights. I get curtains. I get curtains and put them, uh, you know, in a rod. So if you figure this, I got two, two light stands and, and three curtains, sheer curtains, mm -hmm. and they're not white. I got like a little bit of ecru, you know, a little bit of warmer white, and it creates this beautiful filtered light. And I have these LD, LED lights. So this is what I do. I find what my subject is. I place the LED light right behind as my main light. And that's usually powered up like two stops brighter, right? So it's this beautiful light and it just falls off. And further back, maybe about three feet further back or even further, I have the same LED lights, just like soft light coming through. So I'm creating a ratio, though I'm using three LED lights, there's still a contrast ratio and it's all window light. Now I could shoot all day long, daytime or nighttime as if it's window light. So, you know, this is one way you could kind of mimic that and create your own window light with three, you know, email me again. If you guys have questions, again, I'm very approachable. I know Levi, you're gonna send me a couple of questions. So I'll you bet. send you the slides, right? Okay, so this is a video. Tell me if you can see the video because this exactly shows you what trends to a diffuse light is. We're shooting at high noon, figure this. California sun, if I were to take this portrait, it's just horrible. You know, blown out lights, horrible skin tones, hard shadows, nothing pleasing about it. So you see that screen behind her, that's diffuse light. Okay, the sun is right overhead. So I have probably a stop and a half diffuse light coming through, tra transmitted through that light. Now I've, it's assimilated the qualities of that light source. And I have a reflector underneath, not to kick more light in, but to uh, control the contrast. Mm -hmm. So if I have all this light coming behind, you know, diffuse light, all I'm doing is bringing in that contrast to give me a, a little bit more of exposure and it allows me to stop down the exposure. So if I'm at an F4 and I bring that, you know, that bottom reflector, I could kick in probably another stop in there, you know, and I'm not reaching up to 5.6. So I could stop down the ambient a little bit just by controlling the contrast. And I'm basically controlling, I mean, I'm creating a studio outdoors. Let me see if you could see this, um, the video. Is that playing there? It's working, yep. Okay.
I was like, and my assistant's always talking behind my back here. <laughs> I shot this with a 7200 millimeters, you can see, because I wanted that compression behind her. Look, look what I'm doing with the background. If you see the background, it's all dark. <laughs> There's garbage cans right behind her. <laughs> look at the background, it's all dark, because I'm creating the contrast. I, mean, I want to make it seem like it's all in the same place. It's not blown out. Look how nice and soft that light is. So if you saw what I did with the background, I was able to control. Let me go one further here. If that was shot in high noon light, and if I didn't choose, if I wasn't selective with the type of background I'm using, I, I, if, I, if I panned over to the right, it was blown out light. There was a white picket fence, everything was harsh light. Right. It's a telltale sign that, hey, you shot this in hard light and you have this beautiful soft light on her face. You need continuity. You know, you have to be able to make it seem like it's all in the same place shot with the same light. And that's, that's what I do. I'm always selective. I need to see what my background is. And sometimes I light an environmental portrait by determining my background first. Sure. Like what kind of contrast do we have in that background, you know? Sometimes what I do is I choose a background that's one stop brighter than what I'm gonna mm -hmm. light my subject with because now it gives me a hair light or a background separation light without adding the light by creating a compression and using 70 to 200 millimeter lens at about 150 millimeter compression of creating a three-point light setup in natural light. Yeah. So, you know, understanding light gives you the allowance to be creative and execute whatever vision you have, irrespective of what do I have outdoors to work with. Hey, you just have the sun with two boards, make it happen. Right. And just and scan, you know, constantly scan your scenario. And we, we could do that portrait. Uh, you're, you're using very high quality tools to make that picture, but you could really do it with about 50 bucks on Amazon in, uh, in five and one reflectors. Absolutely. It doesn't have to be expensive to, to make great light. Oh my gosh. If, 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 Levi, do you see the behind the scenes shot? And sometimes I don't share because I have my sponsors <laughs> that are very supportive. Right. Uh, we end up people, you know, I get guys taking their white t-shirts off. I've I done that as well. Yeah. You know, I've held up a white t-shirt. Yeah. You got a couple of white t-shirts, <laughs> you know, off camera, you got two guys holding t-shirts and it's a beautiful feel light, you know? Yeah. Or, yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes it's as simple as bringing your subjects from a dark floor to a white cement, you know, get them mm -hmm. on concrete by simply putting them from grass to concrete. You've opened up all this fill light and it's a beautiful, well-balanced portrait. So be again, very, uh, proactive in your approach to portraiture and by that you always have to be scanning but you don't yeah. know until you practice this you know go back and look at your images and say oh my gosh her eyes look flat and dark like right. man, how did you do that where were you shooting oh, i was just like you know out in the fields well the floor was all dark it's all these shrubbery everything was you know dark yeah. gray. it might as well have been dark gray right right so you know be proactive on how you shoot okay so let's talk about creating mood We'll quickly go to these sides. So this is the, this is the guts. Okay, these are the tricks that I use to create these these beautiful portraits with color. And uh, Hernan, we're we're at uh, one fifteen. Okay. Right now. Okay, so we got we got three more slides. Awesome. We'll zoom along. So I don't want you guys to miss this. That's why I want to get to these last slides. These color filters are the ones that are all balanced. Okay, the science is done behind what RGB is. Basically, you're bu bu putting this filtration that it's all calibrated to the sensitivity of what the cameras will see and to what our monitors see. If you're using Photoshop or Lightroom, all these color sensitivities have been done for you. Don't do anything, just understand it. That's all you have to do, understand it. That if you're using a 15, it's you know quarter stop of filtration. And there's a density value of all these filters. If I'm using, a, it's 15, 30, 60, 90. Every color has a prefix meaning it's 42, it's 43, it's 44, it's 48. And those numbers, two numbers are the prefix of to the uh, primary and secondary colors. So it could be red, green, and blue, which would be RGB. So those, if 42 might be yellow, 44 might be cyan or whatever it is, you know? So know what those colors are. And then there's a, a, a suffix, there's two numbers after it, which is the sensitivity value. It holds a certain density. So if you're using a flash, and in that flash, you have, you know, a 200 watt second power flash. And you say, oh my gosh, I'm losing all this light, you know, while well, using a 90, which is a three, three stop, 
it cuts three stops off your yeah. week wide already as it is. So let's just use, you know, let's split the difference. Let's use a one stop, which is a 30, uh, but it gives you the color. So knowing if you're using a green and you're putting a green on this filter, if you put that on your subject creatively, let's say creatively, uh, putting green, that no, that tells you that if you white balance, it's gonna add magenta to the whole scene. So let's say you're going outdoors and the, the skies are blue, but not as blue as you, as you want them. Well, what's the opposite of blue in an RGB? The opposite of blue is yellow. Yeah. So if I'm putting yellow on my filter lights in a white balance, it's gonna add you know, flash, flash, flash. There's so much yellow, I need to add blue. So it's gonna make that blue sky even more vibrant blue. So this is what gives you right out of camera the control and the artistic interpretation of you know of the portraits that you want to execute. So you either do this to uh, color correct or you use this for effects. Um, and this is on a nutshell. You know, you can take a picture of this in a nutshell. This is what it is. The opposite of yellow is blue. The opposite of of uh, green is magenta. The opposite of red is blue. So uh, red is cyan. I'm sorry. So knowing this gives you a quick like, okay, these are my filters. What do I want to do and what do I want to create? Am I trying to balance and neutralize or am I being creative? And this is creative process here, what, I'm, what I did, okay? On my key light, I put a magenta. On my fill light was uh, Roscoe Bloom. And I'm, for my kicker light was green. So I got three colors hitting my subject. And, you know, again, I'm being sensitive to how the intensity of that color will be. Um, I want to show you this quick, quick slide. This is how it's done to um, slight uh, atmospheric difference in color. If I'm shooting outdoors and I'm shooting in natural light and everything tends to be a little bit more blue because I'm using flash and I use flash for this, but I still want to kind of that warm, you know, warm light coming through. All I did was I used a, a parabolic, a big uh, reflector with a straw, you know, color, cal color straw, which is a little bit of yellow. Their skin tones, she already had a little bit of, of, of uh, olive skin. So that olive skin was very um, well balanced with that straw. It made, it made it look natural. That's not white light and it looks very illustrative, very kind of painterly, just by filtering my light. And here's the behind the scenes shot. So those are the shots that I wanted to show you. You know, when you go outdoors and you're trying to filter your light, and you're trying to either be creative or you're trying to be proactive to correct, you know, color cast or inconsistent light from your different light sources, always consider like that Cal color, or in this case, I'm using, you know, light to creative purposes, you know, a portrait had it not been done with, you know, diffusion, had it not been done with amber lights would just be an ordinary portrait. It wouldn't have that same warm, nice appeal to it as this does. Um, so I think we're, I think we're done. Oh, let me show you for you the skin tones. This is the last slide. This, okay, the skin tones are, uh, if you see how beautiful these skin tones, there's no white light in this. It's all either yellow tones, there's uh, amber tones, there's orange tones, there's rosy tones. They're all tones that are uh, like even this here. Look how beautiful that, that ballerina look and there's no white light. It's all done with this here, Naked Cosmetics. If you see the panel on the left, I'm filtering all my lights to control either a feel, you know, to be evocative, to control a, a feel. In this case, it's all sensitive to only skin tones. It doesn't affect the scene, but it only affects the skin tone. That's why they call this cosmetic, because it's very sensitive only to the skin tones. That's the accurate color. So that's the gel. That's the that's the gel brand and color, the naked cosmetic. That's cosmetics. the gel branding, right. And you know, like in her case, she's Caucasian and she had a little bit of that pink tone. So I use the rose, one, two, three, the third color there, the rosy uh, highlight is pretty much the key light, the NCR9, it was my, my key light. That gives it the most effect of the rose color, which was a beauty dish. And I put that directional off camera right to her, which gave me that color tone. Now for my fill light, I used something that was a little bit less rose. You know, it's that same, I might use the rosy hands, the top, top NCR3 which what that does, the white light, the wider that light is, the wider that filter light is, it cancels out the actual effect of the rose, which is, you know, rosy, rosy skin tone. If I were to use everything as a rose, everything will come out too rosy. So by putting that rose as my main light, it gives me that nice wash of rose. By putting that weaker 
light further back is a weak fill. It gives me a hint. You know, it transmits some of the white light, but it still processes that light with a, a rose hint. 88% of filtration comes through. So there's a nice tone of, of neutrality. So you see it and it's like, oh my gosh, it looks beautiful. You know, like it just looks like she's glowing, but yeah, that's the purpose. That's the reason why I use it. Okay. Anyway, man, thank you so much. I'm going to get out of, out of this here. Right. Thank you. Any last I minute questions it. we might have, we, might, we will take, right? Absolutely. Yeah. If, if anyone has any, any questions to weigh in, boy, I sure learned a lot about your color ideas and, and the way that you're coloring your light. It's changing every way, everything I think of right now. Like I'm, I've been going through my, my shoots yesterday. I had four shoots and I've been going through each of those thinking about how I could have uh, used a other than CTO to uh -huh. make this shot look good. And I'm, I'm photographing a dignitary on Friday and I'll, I think I'll be adding some blue to that. That, yeah, that'll be nice. But, yeah. uh, dignitary, what I do with dignitaries, it's, ca it's called Cal Color Bloom, which is like when mm -hmm. we talk about C, uh, CC, and it's 4 4, whatever it is. I use Cal Color um, 15, which is the weakest blue. Mm -hmm. What I do is I get that blue and I double it up. Right on. So I'm using a 30 right out of camera. I use a 15. If it's too weak, I put 30, which most times is 30. And yeah. it has this blue tint all over my subject. And then I add a little bit of the custom white balance that brings back a little bit of the natural, mm -hmm. you know, uh, yellow tones. And it gives me like this beautiful rendering. Well, because so many of our cameras have a, have a really difficult time displaying red the, the right way. You know, it ends up too red oh, yeah. in a photograph. And, and so I'm really excited for that. Uh, Eric wants to know, do you, do you use a color emitter? Uh, no, I don't. I, um, you know, just because I've, I've, I've learned with Calvin so much, you know, basically what I do is this here. This is my trick. Okay, and I'll tell you what, you know, I use the data color spider checker card and I use it for two purposes. Most of the time I get after every shot, every scene shot, I have one of these in, in the set, right? Yeah, me so too. Whether before or after, I make sure I have this. Now, there's two ways of doing this. If I need to just neutralize like the color cast, and let's say, mm -hmm. for instance, I'm using blue filters on all these lights, right? And the blue filters will show on this neutral 18% gray card, and it'll tell me like there's a lot more units of blue. Well, I have it in camera. Right. So I could either do it in camera as a custom white balance, or most of the times I take it to post production. Because when I take it to post, I have this color set here already, the swatch. And by getting yep. it, you know, in uh, Lightroom, I get my color picker and I designate that color. It's going to give you a Cal Calvin jump all the way up to like 8,000 or something crazy, 9,000 all the way off the scale. And, and right. then, you know, the color balance would change. So it'll show you what the neutral balance is if there was, was no blue and what the actual capture shot is. What I do is I split the difference because I'm not putting filters mm -hmm. to take away the filters. I'm using it to right. taste. You know, so this is what I use. I, and this is why I depend this, on this most of the time. Um, and it, it also has a, you know, swatch, you know, 48 swatch color on the other side. If I need to make sure I'm calibrated to a certain dress color or lipstick mm -hmm. color. Especially blues and purples are, and purples. are notoriously poor. Yeah, they're, they're really bad in it'll digital change. cameras. Exactly, it'll go back to that accurate blue and that accurate red, whatever mm -hmm. it is. So that's a great question. But yeah, it's all you know, either in camera or post. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that question, Eric. Um, any other questions? Please feel free to to type in on the chat. And uh, Eric, where where can we catch up with you again? Can you show us your your uh, your contact slide one more time? Uh, Eric, you said Eric. I, was, I, was, I said Eric because I was reading Eric Egley's name. Sorry, Hernan. I mean, where, where can we catch up with you? let's do it man let's do it i'm going to yeah let me go back to the slides here i'm going to go back to yeah let's go back because if you know i think i think you guys could really just send you know your specific questions which would be good here uh could you see that there or do i have to go share screen uh hit your share screen one more time yeah okay let's yeah. see here uh what um, what shoot do you have coming up that you're looking forward to, Hernan? Uh, you know, it's so funny. I was working with uh, CeeLo Green, you know, the uh, musician. 
Yeah. A lot of a lot of these celebrity shoots, it's it's negotiating. And sometimes, you know, some of these photo shoots get lost because, you know, this past year I was gonna photograph ha uh, Halle Berry and you know, everybody was on, it was for a commercial product and a workout line. And I've worked with this company before. They said, this is the photographer we use. So I was on board. Uh, the publicist was on board. Her agent was on board. So that's, that's already a hurdle to get over when the team is on board because they're always very particular. You know, we work with specific right. teams. And she's been working with the photographer for 20 years. And she said, you know, I, I feel very comfortable with just bringing my guy because that's who I, that's the only guy I know. He knows how to light her. And I can respect that because I have celebrities who are very loyal to, to me and to my work, you know? Yeah. I something for, for Showtime. And, you know, after working so many years with these guys, they say, uh, you know what? It, only her will take our picture. So, you know, I, I could appreciate that. So, you know, I, I and then, you know, some, some of them get away. Some of the photo shoots get away. Uh, let me show you one really quick photo shoot I did. Uh, oh, okay, so yeah. the creative process, right? And we'll talk about shooting, shooting on location. I'll share these quick slides with you. That was, you probably saw that on the website with uh, Mario Lopez, right? Mm -hmm. This was uh, one shoot I did with him. And again, it took everybody to be on board, you know? Finally, everybody was on board. The agent was on board, the manager came in, his publicist came in, the, the uh, client came in from New York. It was a product line for his, his fashion wear line. So you get 10 guys on set just calling shots, which is kind of stressful sometimes, right? It's terrible, man, Mark, it's the worst, yeah. You know, and then you're coming, you're, you're shooting Tether and everything is like your mistakes are coming up live, you know, like, oh my gosh, <laughs> what's going on here, you know? But you know, it's, it's a double-edged sword. So, you know, we came in with the brief and this was the brief that he wanted a product line to display, you know, a daytime look, a red carpet, because he does a lot of red carpet events and a gym because he loves, you know, he loves working out in his California lifestyle. So that was the brief we had, you know, and they were very um, elaborate on the specifics of this photo shoot. We're talking about creating mood boards and all that stuff. Uh, this is, this is, this is what that was, you know, all the behind the scenes, this is all everybody hashing out the ideas. This was the final brief. You know, he's fresh, he's contemporary, he brings a modern, confident style to, you know, his celebrity and evokes uh, aspirational LA lifestyle. He's a family man. And these are the pictures that he sent to me. Like, can we do this for his product line? So, you know, it's, it's good because it narrows down my focus and what I need to do. You know, what's the objective of the portrait? This is the objective, the brand identity of his shots. So when I do my shot list, it's, I'm very specific, you know? I, you know, some of the shots that, you know, this look is only full length and this shot is a medium shot, you know, and this shot is editorial, you know, let's go lifestyle. We could go loose with it. We could go tight. We could go anything with it. So I have my whole shot list ahead of time because, you know, and sure enough, when we were there on set, they're marking everything. Like you, you promised us this shot, you know, this is what we were looking for. I have to be able to produce this for them. So, you know, just so you see a little bit of behind the scenes shots with him, uh, this will probably take three more minutes of our workshop here, but this is something kind of cool because it shows you how I work. Okay, you know, we gotta get that light in there. Just put it right on. It's, uh, see. So we got this. Is my product. This is my key photographer, right? This yeah. this guy here to my right. He's got thirty years experience. So I need to have somebody who's as good as I am on set because I'm calling shots and I don't have time to be able to change light. My fill light behind there. You see that fill light? Yeah, I like your perspective. I feel like looking that's the agent at the bottom going through the images, and we're all calling out the shots. Those are his agents on the left. And he broke his leg. He broke his leg a week before. Look at the filter on the light. Everything's filtered. Yeah. Gel on the back. That's not that's not CTO. That's a pill bastard. All my lights are warm lights. One, two, and this is all shot in daylight. I like the ones that are off camera a little bit. Okay, a little bit of interest there. So yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. It's great to see. In fact, if shots I want, then I just shoot probably a candidate of 10, 10 shots, 15 shots. Okay, so that was that. And these are the final images of the shoot. Look how nice that is. Yeah. That was shot in his backyard. You know, that was the lifestyle shot. You know, he's got a pool, he's California. You could see a little bit of that yellow tint on yeah. his skin. There's no white light there, there's a little bit of yellow tint. Uh, you could really see the yellow tint here, right? Everything's filtered to light. We even had a kicker light in the grass back there with the yellow mm -hmm. filter. So that warmed everything up. 
Uh, it doesn't look blue. It doesn't look, you know, it doesn't look like it's, it's flash, though it is flash. Right. Uh, and these were his, his red carpet looks. So, um, yeah, I'm always working. I'm always working. I have a product uh, a shot list. I have a car sheet. I have a uh, storyboard. Everything is done way ahead of time. So anyway, so that was, I'm glad I got to share that because that was uh, some of the things that we talked about. Me too. Thank you very much, Hernan. Um, and yeah, Sylvia says, thank you. Uh, uh, Wendell chimes in with a thanks for a great presentation. We really appreciate your, your time and your sharing. Um, yeah, awesome. That was that was effulgent for sure to, to share so much in depth with us. Yeah, cram pack, and, right? Yes, I, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, again, everybody, this has been recorded. We will post it on photofocus.com for you to, to see once again. And please head over and, and uh, give Hernan a follow and keep up with his upcoming work and things. And, and evidently, we'll see it on Hulu and Netflix and everywhere in between. In yeah, between. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. You know, I think in closing, I think practice, you know, again, it's the opera, it's the intersection of opportunity and preparation. You know, if, if you do this in like all these color filters and everything that I'm talking about, your, your quality of lights, you know, the mood, you know, by color, creating mood, um, you got to do this all in practice, you know, take your family mm -hmm. out, take your kids out, take whatever, you know, take your speed lights out and just put, you know, her and said, put a filter. Let me see what, what a blue filter looks like on my subject with my speed light. And let me do a custom white balance. You know, if you don't have anything, use a white tracing paper, use a white sheet of mm -hmm. paper. That's what, that's what a neutral balance can do as well. You know, take a picture of a, of a white sheet of paper with a speed light. It's, it's cheap. I got a, right. a distant flash, which is $200 with a blue light, create beautiful portraits. Yeah. I, I, I've done the practice, you know, so. This allows you to separate yourself from from what's what's out there now. So you know, absolutely, Thank and that's so the much. difference too. Yeah. yeah, what what can we do different? And you've showed us a whole lot of ways to be different. Yeah. Well, thanks a ton, and uh, we'll catch up with you on photofocus.com in the future too. Awesome. All right, you guys. Thanks, huh?